song of all time. Uh, beautiful things. A little history behind that song is when we were at Big Stuff, we used to go to Panama City, Florida for a big camp, and they had played that song, and when they played that song, it just set. I mean, it just hit home. God really does make beautiful things. Each and every one of us, whether we have disabilities or not, how true this song goes with today's scripture as well. He makes us new. Uh, just an amazing, amazing song. So thank you for starting worship off with that today. As a lot of you know, I have picked up golf recently. One of my hobbies. And as I was reading, doing a little research for today's sermon, I came across a story of a man named Charlie Boswell. Charlie Boswell was a war hero that, while rescuing a buddy from a burning tank, he lost his vision. Now, he'd always been a great athlete, but after the war, he decided he was going to take up golf. I thought, golf? I know how hard golf is being able to see, much less being a blind golfer. So I can't even imagine, although some of you that have seen my game probably would think that. <laughs> Now, his, camp, his caddy would line him up and tell him the distance, and he would just make his smooth, graceful swing. He won the National Blind Golf Championship 16 times, shot a score of 81, pretty good score. Then Charlie was slotted to receive the coveted Ben Hogan Award. Now, many of you know that Ben Hogan, he is considered one of the greatest golfers of all time. So as they were there together, Boswell and Hogan had a conversation, and Boswell asked him if he would like to play around the golf. Hogan said, sure, that sounds like a great thing to do. Well, Charlie said, you want to play for money? He said, I can't play you for money. He felt a little guilty. He said, well, how much would you want to play for? Well, Boswell said, how about $1,000? 1000 per hole. He's like, 1000 per hole? No. He said, I'd be like taking advantage of you. How many strokes would I have to give you for this? He said, you don't have to give me any strokes. So finally, Mr. Hogan said, yeah, I'll pay you. Charlie looked at him with a big grin on his face and says, Mr. Hogan, our tea time is tonight at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so perception. Perception is a very funny thing. Now, Ben Hogan obviously was seeing this match in a totally different light, literally speaking. We tend to do that also. The way that we were raised, our upbringing, the things that we come across in life can change the way we see things and how we can relate to them and how we react to the things that happen to us. Now, of the five senses, sight is one of the most important. It's one sense that can take us from feeling happy to extremely sad in just a matter of an instant. Some of us have been lucky enough to see the sunset over an ocean and see that beauty and see all these beautiful things that God has created. I'd like to ask you to close your eyes for a moment and envision a sun setting over the ocean. That vision is easy for most of you to see. And our visions are probably pretty similar. Now wipe that image away and stare into total darkness. Imagine never being able to see from birth. You can only see what others tell you. You can only see visions that others explain. Now our visions may not be so similar. to how maybe a blind man's perception or someone with a disability perception may be different than someone that doesn't have that. I wonder, after reading this text, how others seen this blind beggar. What was their perception of the blind beggar? Did they see him as a problem that they had to deal with? I mean, they seen this man every day probably sitting outside with his tin cup, shaking his tin cup, looking for handouts. Just desperate for help. 
some probably walked the other way intentionally around this man so they didn't have to help. Or maybe they helped yesterday so they thought we're good today, we don't have to help today. So they intentionally bypassed him. Many, as they walked up to him, asked what caused his blindness. Was it the sin of his parents that caused him to be blind? Well, the disciples that walked up with Jesus asked Jesus that very same question. And Jesus told him it was no result of what anyone did that caused his blindness. It was so God's power could be seen through him. So at that point, as the story tells us, Jesus stopped and spat on the mud and took the mud and wiped it on his eyes. He told him to go wash his face in the pool of Siloam. And he did. Now, I can imagine that blind man being blind and probably trying just about every remedy he had ever heard of up to this point to gain his vision. I know I would. If I was blind, anybody that come by or anything that I heard might work, I'm going to try it. So <coughs> here's Jesus asking him to do this. He sat, he listened, he did it. Because of this man's patience, obedience, and faith, he could now see. Now, can you imagine never being able to see, and then all of a sudden you can see again for the healing of Jesus? I can see this guy running around to everybody, just kind of tugging on their shirts, getting in their face, grinning, saying, look, I can see, I was blind, I can now see. I can just see that. But those neighbors and others that seen him didn't perceive this exactly the same. They looked at this man and said, is that the same guy? Some of them said, yeah, well, it sure looks like him. Others said, I don't know. It's, it's just sketchy. We just don't understand how this could possibly happen. So there was a lot of questions at the time. But the man came up to him and said, yep, it's me. I'm the same man. I was blind. Now I can see. So he told them what happened. And where did Jesus go at this time? As you see, the story starts with Jesus healing the man, and then Jesus may have slipped away. Or maybe this man was so overcome with joy at that one point in time, he went to celebrate. And he didn't go back and thank Jesus. We don't know. The text doesn't necessarily say but I know that sometimes I can find myself doing that. Sometimes when things are just going great, things are just rolling around real smooth, sometimes I can lose that focus, lose that focus on God. And I think that, you know, sometimes we think we're under, in, in control, but realize later on that we really aren't. Now the Pharisees, after hearing this story, they wanted answers. They said this could not have been a man of God because he broke the Sabbath law. At the time, even doctors weren't allowed to heal on Sundays, on the Sabbath day. Unless, of course, the person was dying and needed immediate care. So they were like, how can a man of God be a sinner? They did, this didn't conform to their rules. It didn't make sense to them. It wasn't part of their rituals. And if they acknowledged that this took place, what is that going to do? It's going to change what they stand for. It's going to change what their church is. It's just going to cause all kinds of ruckus. So they asked him the same questions, and he again said the same thing. But they weren't, the Jewish authorities weren't willing to believe that this man was actually born blind. They wanted to disprove this. They wanted to discredit this because they seen a problem here. Nobody rejoiced with this guy. You see a problem in that? This guy can now see. Nobody rejoiced. And here, now the Pharisees, they don't believe that maybe he wasn't even born blind. So they visited his parents. This is another thing that stood out to me at the time. Where were this, this guy's parents? Where was the blind man's parents throughout this? Why was he, uh, why did he result to be a beggar? Now he was on the streets begging every day, but his parents were home and be doing quite well. Was it because that he was too much of a burden for them? Was it because they were too, he was too much work? Or were they too selfish? Maybe it was because others, they couldn't take it because others were 
pointing fingers at them all the time. What sin did you guys possibly have that caused your son's blindness? So they had a lot of ridicule, possibly, so they sent this man. They, they sent him out. Sent him on the streets. What we know at this point is they didn't stand up for him during his questioning. Here the Pharisees come, ask questions, and the parent says, Yep, that's our son. He was born blind. He says he can see. We don't know anything else. Go ask him. He's of age. So, at the time, if you associated yourself with someone other than the God of Moses, and thought that Jesus was the Savior, that you would be expelled from the synagogue. So his parents did not want to take this up to this risk during this case. So, they said, go ask him. <coughs> so the Pharisees came back to him a second time, and that's where the conversation probably gets a little heated. They told him to tell the truth, that this man is a sinner. That guy looked at him and says, you know, I don't care if this guy's a sinner or not. I can see. I have vision. I can look around and see you talking to me and see you getting argumentative. I've already told you what's happened, and you're clearly not listening to me. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become a disciple of Jesus? They didn't like that. They got a little furious at the time. And the Pharisees told them that they were Moses' disciple because God actually spoke to Moses. They don't know who this man Jesus is or where he came from. And he says, you know, have you ever heard of a man being healed of a blind blindness from birth? If that's not a man of God, then what is it? I mean, wake up, is there a sound? Wake up, really. Well, things got a little tough for them, and they seen the easiest thing that they could do was to expel this guy from the synagogue. So that's what they did. They didn't want him spreading more of these, this word, but others believe in him and creating this change that could happen to their church. So Jesus at this time heard what happened. And he came back. At this point, he wanted to complete this man's transformation. He wanted to know who healed him so that his faith would continue to grow. Who do you relate to in this text? Do you relate to the blind man that is celebrating, jumping up and down, shouting to others, telling others about the amazing God? Or are you the neighbor that never took the opportunity to really get to know someone in need? The neighbor that walked by, walked the other way, each and every day. Maybe you're the Pharisees, unwilling to change your rituals, unwilling to change the way you do things. You know, I can see myself at times fitting each one of these bills. And I think... I need to find myself being more open to the endless surprises of God's Spirit. Now, physical blindness can be a horrible thing. But I can tell you, spiritual blindness is far more dangerous. The worst place we can be is to think that we are fully sighted in a spiritual sense. And we are not by any means. This man that we talk of today, he gained his, not only gained his spiritual sight, or his physical sight, but also his spiritual sight. He never changed his story under intense pressure. He knew what he knew, and he was going to share his story. He gave witness as to what Jesus had done for him. Many times his witness was maybe incomplete or inadequate. But it was always growing. It was leading him to a fuller understanding that Jesus came and gave him. <clears throat> this growth, as with me and my commissioning process, 
I hope that I can be like this blind man, that I can celebrate the joy of God and share this with each and every one of you and the youth and children of this church. Being commissioned, as Penny said, is not an end. It is something that you continue to grow, as with our spiritual life. Our spiritual life is never fully sighted. We must continue to work on that. If we acknowledge our blindness, we will live in the light. However, if we believe we see fully, we will stumble in the darkness. Jesus is the light of our world, and he will never 